Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq and the uh, Wolastokia peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. Um, these treaties, um, you should know, did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolastokia title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. So, um, uh, having done that, um, I would like to, uh, to uh, welcome our panelists and introduce them to you. Um, and this will be an order of presentation. Um, uh, first of all, uh, at the far end of the table is Barbara Lowe. Um, she uh, is a grassroots Mi'kmaq, um, in her words, uh, recovering from Canada's genocidal child and family services policies, which resulted in her being raised away from her culture. She has been involved in land and water defense from coast to coast for more than three decades. Uh, she has also been criminalized for her activism, um, labeled as a threat to Canada, and um, experienced uh, a visit from a uh, CSIS agent, um, which she says Stephen Harper sent to her house here in Antkinish, um, where she has been residing for the last nine years. Uh, she is particularly concerned with the dynamics of solidarity, and respectful relationship building between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people and doing her best to live treaty every day um, and hopefully the same is for us. Uh, Peter McGinnis, who is uh, going to be the second person to go and sitting in the um, middle of the panel, is a historian of Canadian and North American history who has written on labor and working class movements. His current research focuses on how museums commemorate popular history in a time of economic decline and regional disparity. Uh, Professor McInnes is chair of the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee of the Canadian Association of University Teachers and is an advocate for freedom of speech and progressive dissent. He also serves on the St. Effex Committee on Reconciliation, charged with effectively implementing recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada um, at this university. Come on in. Welcome. Hi. And uh, finally, um, our last uh, presenter will be Patricia Cormack, um, who is a member of the sociology department here at St. Effex, and uh, who is interested particularly uh, in an analysis of the Canadian state uh, in the uh, in the sense of it administering our experiences, our identity, and our history. So I'd like to invite you to give a warm welcome to, uh, to our panelists. The way we will proceed is that uh, each presenter will have between five and ten minutes to, uh, to uh, give their presentation. Uh, that will be followed by uh, an additional two minutes for uh, each if they uh, forget, uh, want to say something that they forgot to mention the first time around, and if they don't, they won't pass. Uh, and then we will open the floor up for, uh, for questions and for discussion with, uh, with um, the audience. So um, having said that, oh, Barbara has warned me uh, that she may get up and, uh, and start walking during her presentation. So. Um, in any event, I'd like to turn the um, I'd like to turn things over to our panelists, and I'll give you a signal when you've got a couple of minutes left on your presentation. So, the floor is yours, Barbara. Okay, uh, Jalazi, uh, welcome to Lingmagi. 
whether you've been here for a week or whether your family has been here for several generations, I'm grateful to be here with you today uh, doing our best to live treaty together, the treaties of peace and friendship. So I'm really grateful to be here today. And so the topic, uh, the context of reconciliation, it might upset a, little, a few of you tonight, but we do need to look at the, the whole context of what's going on right now. And I would submit that the context of reconciliation is occurring in an ongoing genocide in Canada. I'll just rhyme off some uh, examples here that are really current. So today, we've even seen in the paper that the city of Halifax is still deciding whether or not to keep the Cornwallis statue up. Now, General Cornwallis was here for three years. And during that time, he saw fit to issue scalp bounties on every Mi'kmaq man, woman, and child. Okay. Now, this is not long after he had participated in the Highland Clearances in Scotland and locked up Scottish families and set their homes on fire, again, with men, women, and children inside. It's really, really difficult for us maybe want to understand why this would continue to be an issue to this day. We don't understand why Scottish settlers would want Cornwallis to, to, to be lionized here. Okay, so, you know, and they're discussing this like it's an issue. I mean, Nova Scotia right now is behind the Jim Crow South in the United States. Think of that. They're taking down slave statues to slavery there. So that just happened today and is ongoing as we know. We're pulling bodies from the river in Thunder Bay on a weekly basis of our young people who go to school there. Cindy Gladue Last year, the Canadian court's judicial system saw fit to extract the vaginal tract from a murder victim, preserve it, and then display it in court as evidence. This would never have happened to a European descent settler in Canada but this is what Canada has done to Indigenous women. That incident with Cindy Gladue's body almost distilled the whole colonial project right down for me into what they did in displaying the parts of a life giver, which is what we call women in our cultures, in a court as evidence. He was found not guilty. Colton Bushy was out with his friends in Saskatchewan last summer. They had a fun day down at the lake and such, and they were on their way home, and they got a flat tire, and they pulled up into a farm looking for some help with the flat tire. Colton Bushy was shot dead that day for asking for help. And then after that, a Facebook group was begun by farmers in Saskatchewan who were supporting the murderer of Colton Bush. We're still look, looking for justice for Colton today. Again, this was just last year. Most rec more recently, you've been hearing about core sterilizations, forced sterilizations of Indigenous women. And this is not, you know, 150 years ago. Again, this is the recent, some in 2007. This is current events. And that's also uh, prohibited under the Geneva Convention on Genocide for sterilizations of a group. That is an act of genocide. Escaped fish from salmon farms. Well, our salmon stocks on the east and west coast, the wild salmon stocks, are plummeting for a number of reasons, the least of which is, not, is climate change and overfishing. But the salmon farms are also contaminating and taking care of what's left of the wild stocks. And for uh, Mi'kmaq people, we're salmon people. There's people on the West Coast that are salmon people. And an end to the salmon means an end to their culture, to who they are. Again, this is current. 
collapsing, collapsing ecosystems. I was talking to a couple of friends when we were walking up here about how it was such a terrible beauty today to be outside in my shorts and sandals and kicking through the leaves. It didn't feel right. Grassy narrowness. That's where Indigenous peoples have been poisoned on purpose by the Canadian government. That continues to play out. There's over 100 water advisories in First Nations communities across Canada right now, today. There's also over 100 land claims winding their way through the courts. Some have been in the courts for over 100 years. We've got a senator in the name of Lynn Bayer and literally calling for genocide of Indigenous peoples. We've got Joseph Boyden and fake maybes being made the face of us and erasing actual Indigenous voices. We've got Jonathan Kay, who is one of the biggest media moguls in Canada, you know, making racist comments on Twitter all the time against Indigenous people. He was the editor of The Walrus and ended up actually losing his job because of that. But these are powerful Canadians and Canadian literature who are slagging us on Twitter all the time. Just last week, some settlers saw fit to burn some of our, one of our fishing boats. Because we were trying to go fishing, which is what we have done from the beginning. We have always fished, we have always hunt and hunted, and we're going to keep on doing those things. In every time we go to court, we win, and we go fishing, and then they come at us again, whether it's the settlers or the DFO, even though we have won in the court, Donald Marshall Jr., rest his soul. Indigenous peoples live in extreme poverty. Our poverty rates are very high. In incarceration, we're overrepresented in incarceration in Canada and in, in the jails in Canada. And often that's not because we're bad people, that's because we can't afford a lawyer. Or we're facing racism from the police right down to the judges. Alton Gats, there's a uh, Alton Gas is a um, gas project that's going on near Stewiak. They want to make a, a gas storage uh, unit there. And we have not been consulted on this. And the Nova Scotia government saw fit to get a lawyer who made a submission saying that we're a conquered people, that the Mi'kmaq are conquered. We're not conquered. Um, our treaty doesn't say anything about land cessation. Our treaty is not for us, the Mi'kmaq. Our treaty is for you. The treaty is rules of engagement for you to live in these lands peacefully and in a friendly manner. And for us, peace and friendship is not just the absence of war. It's the presence of everyone living well. Everyone. There's the 60s scoop. You may have just started to hear about some of this where our children were taken out of their homes, much like the residential schools, but instead of being sent to residential schools, we were sent to live with non-natives. Or in cases where, like in my case, where my father is big mom, my mother is, is, uh, is non-native, and so Canada decides that it's best for me to be with a non-native family and not have any access to my culture at all. And that can of genocide hasn't been opened yet. Right now, there are more of our children in care than ever were in the residential schools. And they're not in care of our people. They're not in care of our culture. Everything that we want and need as Indigenous people has always been the same from the beginning. We just want to be us. You can look back in the written records even, and in our oral records, and all we have ever wanted to be was to be Ulnu. Ulnu is what we Mi'kmaq people call ourselves. We just want to be Mi'kmaq, we just want to be Ulnu. And we want you to live here well with us. Um, but it's been an abusive relationship. It's been an abusive relationship for a couple of hundred years. And so it's not going to be fixed instantly, it's not going to be fixed overnight. 
You can't just go to a ceremony and go, okay, I really like the Mi'kmaq now and I'm going to be with them. This is going to take hard work for all of us. Um, but I think that it's worth it, right? It's, it's do you think this relationship is important? And if you think this relationship is important and worth it, you'll be willing to work through it. Um, we've got a long way to go. It's going to take a few generations. But colonialism is not over. The genocide continues. And when I list all of those things, you know, like reconcile this, reconcile these things. How can we reconcile when these things are still happening to us. And they're being done in your name. You know, often we have people saying, I can hear some of you right now saying, well, I'm not doing it. I have nothing to do with that. But you benefit from it. Everything that has been done to Indigenous peoples in Canada from the beginning of settlement in earnest, everyone here benefits from, except for us, Indigenous peoples. But we're not going anywhere, you're not going anywhere, so let's work through this. Peter? So I'm just going to get up because I want to show a couple of images that, uh, that I want you to take uh, kind of a hierarchical position. Okay. So, um, yeah, good evening and thanks a lot for uh, coming to this. I think it's uh, an important opportunity to discuss some timely issues of Canadian culture, history, and politics. Um, Chris mentioned in the introduction that um, I'm involved in something with the Canadian Association, uh, Association of University of Teachers. Part of that was um, a woman at Dalhousie named Asma Khan uh, had criticized in the summer of Canada 150 uh, and then came in for a lot of uh, abuse. Uh, her response was, you can kiss my butt, or words to that effect. And then she was put on a kind of disciplinary pro process uh, which would have concluded sometime in December and left her as a senior graduating student twisting uh, for some time. Uh, so our organization, our provincial organization, most universities and uh, the faculty of law, Dell and others wrote letters in uh, saying this is uh, unfair, it's never critical, given that Dell has had a history of problems with their dentistry faculty, you may remember, and other things. Um, and as far as CUT was concerned, we were involved in a very extensive report uh, dealing with sexual harassment of a, of a medical doctor in the faculty of medicine named Gabrielle Horn. Uh, and she was uh, harassed by her colleagues uh, in that area. And we have a report that came down a year ago. The University of Dalhousie has refused to do anything about it since then. So there's a systematic issue here. So that's 150. That was, and Dalhousie as of um, this afternoon has withdrawn their charges against Mas McCann and her, her inappropriate comments about 150. So let me take an historical perspective. Um, the contrast, I want to contrast the uh, celebration of the Canadian centennial in 1967. Uh, to the uh, Susquehanna Centennial or Canada 150 this year, which is just going to conclude obviously by the end of December. When the centennial year was being planned, and the planning started in earnest in 1963, uh, a number of events were um, uh, sketched out. One was a what was called a Centennial Voyager pa Canoe Pageant. So canoes uh, would move from Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, uh, and they raced to each other, ending up at uh, Expo 67 in uh, Montreal. Nothing in that, and I was looking at some of the documents, uh, talked about that the voyageurs were, of course, part of the fur trade. And the fur trade opened up the interior, and it was critical to get the furs was uh, indigenous participation, uh, but it also led to um, colonization. So, you know, we had an event that kind of makes an allusion to historical events, but it doesn't weigh in, it's really uh, devalued and kind of stripped of its context. So that was interesting. Uh, I'm old enough to, I shouldn't uh, probably admit that, to have attended Expo 67, uh, and, uh, well, my parents, um, and uh, I remember going on the monorail, uh, I remember going into the great geodesic dome, uh, which was the American uh, uh, pavilion or their display, it was full of NASA space stuff, 
um, cultural artifacts, uh, including the pictures of John Wayne and Marilyn Monroe. There wasn't any um, reference to the U.S. cavalry and the massacres of um, indigenous First Nations uh, or Wounded Knee or any of that. Um, but one pavilion which I don't remember going to, uh, and I don't think we did, uh, was a different one. And this pavilion was a bit on the side. Here's an image of it. And this was the, a strange pavilion called the Indians of Canada Pavilion. Uh, and this was supposed to be, again, a fairly um, uh, you know, non-controversial um, idea of inclusion. Uh, so when Queen Elizabeth, in a role as Queen of Canada, came to visit the pavilion, she went through the entrance and she read these words, quote, you have stolen our land, you've stolen our culture, you've stolen our soil. It went on with that. So it was not the dissident. She apparently, her handlers, handlers kind of moved her out and she said, I'm uh, not going to deal with that. It was part of the 1960s red power culture of pushing back against this. Uh, and uh, the pavilion stayed open for the uh, duration of Expo 67, but it was somewhat marginalized. Uh, and some academics have written about this, but it's there was some um, angry uh, you know, feedback about this even in 1967. The second thing was, um, if you, um, uh, in that year, 1967, um, you may remember a popular historian, uh, Pierre Burton, who wrote a number of books. Uh, he published a book uh, near the end of his career. Uh, it was entitled 1967, The Last Good Year. And what he's making is that this was the last good year when, well, the Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup, uh, Canada was a more friendly nation at that point, and he's clearly also saying we don't have the problems the Americans had because that summer of 1967 was the Detroit riots and riots elsewhere in inner cities of the U.S. where the, the National Guard were called tanks and in downtown Detroit uh, and uh, significant loss of life of uh, African Americans. Um, but we instead had a commission by the Expo, commission, uh, the Expo um, Committee, uh, Gordon Lightfoot, who sang the Railroad Trilogy, which I was sponsored to do that, uh, but nothing in that Railroad Trilogy talks about that the railway was moved through um, Aboriginal territory, it subdivided that land, interrupted the, the bison uh, migration, uh, and in fact moved troops to suppress the resistance of Métis under Louis Vial and Gabriel Dumont. Uh, so there's a little, a little bit of history about what's left out. So the question often is for historians, not so much what's included, but what's not included, what's not there. Another centennial initiative through the National Film Board was um, put together um, a idea of training young um, Aboriginal people, Indigenous people in filmmaking. This was under a program started that year called Challenge for Change, uh, or Société Nouvelle, uh, and what they would do is uh, use the idea of cinema verite, so fairly rough <coughs> ideas. One of the first films that came out uh, was this one, You Are on Indian Land, uh, and this was put together by Mohawks at what uh, was then known as the St. Regis Reserve uh, near Cornwall, Ontario, as Akwesasne, uh, and what they were trying to argue was that they were able to cross into Canadian or U.S. territory as a result uh, of the Jay Treaty of 1794. Uh, and if you, you can get that online, it's available on the NFU website, it's about 35 minutes. And what, one interesting thing about it, and there's one point, they, so there's a peaceful um, protest, they're just trying to block traffic. The police show up, um, then the band chief shows up in his car, and he says to the, the police, give me a gun, I'll shoot the Mohawks. You know, I'll shoot my own people. And they said, well, we can't give you a gun. He said, I'll, I'll use my tire iron. He represents that, that dysfunctional band culture. Everybody said this guy is a collaborator with the oppressors. And so that's a really interesting uh, account. And, and one of the people uh, who was leading that became the Grand Chief of the Akrasazi Reserve for many years. So uh, obviously this narrative is different when we address the issue 50 years later with the reality I don't know more and Black Lives Matter and others. So if you come to, uh, or I should mention just in, in closing, the Mohawk signed their letters at Akwesasne in reference obviously to the FLQ crisis in Quebec. Uh, they signed it, vive la sauvage libre. And we are a part of that, so it's very clear. So uh, when we come to the ubiquitous Centennial logo, this is on the Centennial logo on the left. 
uh, if you're of an age and already identified by AM, uh, you can see this everywhere. You can still see this logo on buildings that were constructed in the centennial year, uh, 1967. Off to the right is the uh, current logo, the 150 logo, uh, which is another version of this. And I'm, I, I think the color is supposed to be a main mosaic of Canadians coming together and enjoying the maple leaf. Uh, but what started, started to happen is, uh, this, this commonplace was the um, 1967 logo. You actually didn't see very much. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. I mean, you would see some flags around, but it was nothing like. So the question is, why is 2017 so muted, so um, undercut? It's not as so simplistic as it was back 50 years ago. And of course, this is the version, you could call this culture jamming. So they're taking that logo, putting it in black and white, uh, holding it upside down. If you hold a flag upside down, it's, it's a flag sign of distress. Uh, so it's colonials of 150. So what can we say about this? Uh, well, let me leave you off with one more example. Uh, in Ottawa, uh, Hull, uh, you can go across to the what was formerly known as the Museum of Civilization, designed with a kind of organic sandstone shape by the Métis Blackfoot Algonquin architect Douglas Cardinal, uh, renamed under the Harper regime, uh, Harper government, I'm sorry, um, the, Canadian, the Canadian Museum of History. So it's very clear what it's about. Um, and you go into their main exhibit, which was just open on Canada Day, July 1st, called the Canadian History Hall, again. Um, and you will see more indigenous content. Um, there's a reference to the Ashtonabe right in the entrance and you go through. It's, it's a lot better than it was, but clearly the message still is white settler colonialism was the way to go and it's about adapting. Really that narrative has not changed. It's maybe sprinkled with a little paprika, but it's not really that changed. So uh, this, uh, you know, people have gone through this and they said they have mixed feelings about it. Um, but it really doesn't overcome the re-evaluation and re-definition um, of Canadian history recently uh, undergoing under the Harper government, but then continued by the Trudeau liberals, which is to emphasize militarism, uh, to emphasize, de-emphasize other things, um, or to bring in Aboriginal people, Indigenous people as a kind of token presence. So there's a, a, a group of small statues just down from Parliament Hill called the Valiants, and there's one uh, Aboriginal person, and they're just in with the other generals uh, and military servers. So in the end, I would say uh, the message is still one of European dominance. Inevitable modernization of First Nations is reinforced. So Canada at 150 is a more contested, more conflicted concept of a country than it was 50 years ago, uh, certainly from what I remember. And yet we must continue to address the realities of our shared past and lasting consequences of a settler colonialism uh, if we are to arrive at a more complete and accurate depiction of uh, where we are today. Thank you. You guys are scary in your, uh, your precision at 10 minutes. It's been bang. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the hot seat now. I should have thought. So. Okay. <laughs> Somebody said, I said to someone, how long should I talk? And he said, uh, as a true friend would, he said, no one's going to fault you for going short. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so for me, and I'm finding out that we're all very close in age, very, very close in age, um, and, I, and I think um, many white colonial minds, and I won't say post-colonial, uh, reading the Truth and Reconciliation Report was like being turned upside down. It brilliantly juxtaposed the personal accounts of children coming up against the church state apparatus of conscious and intentional cultural genocide. That point of contact, its emphasis on the huge state machinery and the small bewildered kids, soon to be swallowed up and never be the same again, never to know themselves or their families the same way, is profound. They, they, um, there may be something in the very method of this Truth and Reconciliation Report that points toward reconciliation and not just in the concrete calls to action at the end of the report. Does something about the humble child recommend itself to us? Many readers, I think, of this Truth and Reconciliation Report will remember the haircutting stories. Hard to read. As the storytellers also try to account for the unceremonious callous act and one survivor said, I guess they don't know. They didn't know. 
This is a generous interpretation. It also raises the question of privilege. Who gets to not know? I remember the boy terrified of seeing a crucifix for the first time. He rightly recognized it as a Roman imperialist, as a Roman imperialist intended it to be seen. A graphic and horrible object that symbolizes real and symbolic violence. He took it as a warning about what happens to you if you're bad. Why else post such a thing at the entrance to the door of an institution? How could you overlook the obligation to explain this horror to a child? All of a sudden, my own childhood began to take a completely different shape. So I have two stories about my childhood. I grew up in the late 60s, early 70s in Winnipeg. I never recognized that even one of my closest friends what we used to call native, literally from here. That is all the context, in the context of the heady celebrations of Canadianness and part of the state, especially in schools. We learned proudly that we were inclusive and tolerant, and ironically not to tolerate those Americans who aren't tolerant. Um, <laughs> The federal government pumped money into the new multiculturalism project, one that initially was biculturalism to appease growing Quebec nationalism. We were encouraged to talk about ourselves as hyphenated Canadians, Ukrainian Canadians, and German Canadians. As a kid, I attended something called Folklorama, which still happens in Winnipeg each year. You get a passport and you visit these white pavilions where cultural identity is celebrated in food and dance. It's a consumable version of identity with no edge, and there was no indigenous pavilion until last year. So it turns out that my friend, and it hit me like a bolt out of the blue 40 years later, was of course a child of the 60s scoop. I don't know if she ever knew herself as indigenous because she never mentioned it to me. No adults added this identifier to these kids, even in the middle of all the celebration of ethnic identity. Second story. A few years ago, my brother, who still lives in Winnipeg, was driving me and my other brother around our old neighborhood. At a stop sign, he pointed at a huge old building surrounded by trees, and he said, do you know what that is? No. It's a residential school. Shit. There was no more talk. The point was clear. We'd grown up blissfully ignorant of what ha was happening around us. Talk about privilege. But how, do, how does this happen? Well, if you look at the ideology of the time, it comes out pretty clearly. Canada, we are told, is a young country. Its identity as a nation state dates only back to Confederation. So any history before that just wasn't in our consciousness. Canada has too much geography and not enough history. It's an empty space. Mackenzie King, it's, there's nothing there. No one there. Canada is in a perpetual identity crisis. The CBC loves this one, still melting into today. There were a constant death, we don't know who we are. So you put this together, we're young, we have, we have an empty territory with no one in it, and we don't even have an identity. So, then we don't have to account for ourselves in any possible way. This talk shores up colonial interests to appear on the scene as if nobody's here to fill up the space and make history on our terms. I was struck in the context of the Cornwallis statue protest that one of the protesters said, that their request was a modest one. I think it's a very modest one. But how are we able to constantly see it as unreasonable, as too much, as immodest? This person was communicating the modesty of just wanting to be able to walk through a public space and not be assaulted by a monumental celebration of a man who sent out scalping decrees against them. These statues themselves didn't do a lot of work of making the protesters small and irrational seeming. As we've learned by looking to south of the border, those public monuments to white men were often put up with a rhetorical response to resistance. They have context. Most were mass-produced, cheap, tinny things put up in a hurry. Peaking at the height of Jim Crow in 1963, another huge peak to meet that dream speech. These objects make a claim on history and on public space. As a medium, they somehow claim to be inevitable perhaps the most level of colonial rhetorical trips. To those who say they can't take down the statue because it is history, we can say that the statue has a history, but it's not the embodiment of history. What is the history of the Cornwallis statue? It was put up in the 30s by the railway to attract tourists, deeming Cornwallis the, quote, founder of Halifax, in other words, to make money. The pathos of so many of these statues becomes plain when we see a bird sitting on their wrinkled heads. 
or when they're hoisted by a crane, their inevitable gesture pointing into the future or back to the metropole, now swinging in every direction like a disoriented compass, or on the back of the flatbed truck now pointing absurdly up to the sky. Why are these claims on history and identity so heavy? And why aren't they more easily movable? <coughs> if it were to reveal that Cunard, whose statue is across from Cornwallis, was a serial rapist, among other things, who did great things for Halifax, we say, would we ask women to put up with a revised plaque that says so? Otherwise, he's a great guy, the plaque says, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, asking them to still walk under that each day and their children and their daughters to do so too, would we say, hey, gals, you can put up one of your feminist statues right across from him and share the space? <laughs> would we expect that much modesty? If we, uh, if we ask not what was lost by removing Cornwallis, I should say the statue, and ask what is gained, we're not losing history, we're not losing identity. I think it's a very modest request. Well, I give you guys an opportunity if there's anything you want to just add on. Um, and then I can turn the uh, things over to the audience. I, I would just add uh, quickly, and of course, um, Barnos is uh, and Patricia that while we're talking about the Truth of Reconciliation uh, Commission, the 94 calls to action, that only came about because of the class action suit to settle the residential schools issue. They were forced through courts and had been through, from, for, for a long time, the Indian Act did not allow um, Indigenous people to use the courts, uh, and that didn't change until um, quite recently, last less than slightly over 50 years ago. And then we see a, a series of cases. Uh, the Calder case, Sparrow, Dominguez, Marshall, others, uh, all of them through that course process. That's one way to seek um, some form of reconciliation. It's a very slow process. Um, and what we've said about the 94 uh, calls to action, uh, most accounts by indigenous activists are suggesting very few of them are being acted upon. Uh, there's a lot, there's a long way to go. Yeah, I would submit that none of the calls to action really have been put in yet. Um, and we're still waiting for the RCAP recommendations, by the way. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples uh, report was released in 1996, and it had arisen because of the Oka crisis. And there was an attempt to find out how we had come to that place and to find a way to not come to that place again. And up to that time, it was the uh, most uh, comprehensive conversation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in the country, because there were hearings held across the land. And this report, like you can't get a hold of it physically, because it's just volumes and volumes. But there are condensations available online. There were over, four, there was, I think, 440 recommendations from that, many of which are replicated in the TRC <coughs> uh, recommendations. Uh, they were supposed to be implemented over 20 years. Canada had 20 years. And I think of those over 400, there was like eight of them implemented. That's how we got the APTN, Aboriginal People's Television Network. And I just wanted to also, I didn't speak about Canada 150. Yeah, amongst uh, many Indigenous peoples, there are people who have gone and danced and drummed at certain events or whatever, but many of us, like my first question to Chris when Chris contacted me to speak here was, is there any Canada monies, 150 monies involved or whatever, because I don't want nothing to do with it, right? Um, and so many Indigenous people, like some of our, our bigger folks, like a tribe called Red and that, they, they stepped out of, out of uh, events that had anything to do with Canada 150. Um, many of us see Canada as nothing more, actually, than the Hudson's Bay Company, right? I mean, some of us just call it a corporation. It's just, it's still an outpost. Um, we could argue and debate about the legitimacy, actually, of Canada as a country, even more so than we could debate, debate uh, Mi'kmaq nations claim to being a nation. Um, because the country, Canada, is built by the treaties. And if you take the treaties out, especially the foundational peace and friendship ones, Canada doesn't exist anymore as a legal entity. Uh, 
So to us, it's just this is just an extension of the Hudson's Bay Company. It's a corporate branding, you know, that is that has gone on. It's just uh, like I think that actually now I'm always telling Canadian settler friends, you, you know, you don't have a democracy, right? You have a corporatocracy, right? Um, and where corporations rule now. That's kind of happened with neoliberalism the last 30 years. Uh, so. Anyway, I just wanted to say that about Canada 150 that you know many of us have wanted nothing to do with it whatsoever this year. Thanks, Barb. Uh, Trisha, do you have anything you want to? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> um, we're ready to rock and roll. Um, uh, I can uh, just kind of get things started by saying just uh, one one thing about Paul Wallace is that uh, he took his uh, his, uh, his show on the road to uh, to the United States, India, and Ireland as well as yes. Scotland yes. and Canada. So yes. he was a world traveler in the uh, genocidal circles um, yes. and he practiced his art widely. Um, I'm interested in uh, asking uh, Barbara about uh, about I know more. I, this was one thing that really jumped out at me a few years ago and especially about the youthfulness of it and it just seemed to come out of nowhere to those of us who were interested in knowing better. But anyway, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that sure. movement and about maybe your involvement. Well, I have tremendous respect for the four founding women of I Don't Know More. They began doing teach-ins in their local communities in Saskatchewan. <coughs> and during the course of those teach-ins, they just said, you know, let's, we need, we need to be visible. We need to be visible. We're not visible to Canadians. There are people who have lived in Antigonish all their lives and have never broken bread with Mi'kmaq person, even though there's a community, you know, 15 minutes down the road, right? And that's the same with Canada. To a certain degree, there's been, of course, enforced segregation by the government, but also, We've also taken a little bit of sanctuary too, um, because coming into town can be difficult um, for for many Indigenous peoples. It can be dangerous. Uh, so I also say, like, never never confuse segregation with sanctuary. Sometimes it's chosen. Uh, so you all saw I don't know more, and probably now you think, oh, I don't know more is gone now. It's done. How many think that here? Okay. <laughs> 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 and say you haven't heard anything. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't know more because I don't know more was for us. It was for indigenous people. It was a resurgence of our cultures. It was um, some of the older ones saying it's okay for us to be who we are, to be visible, to uh, begin regaining our languages. And what came out of that is that there was, of course, a bunch of public, you know, round dances, and you saw us, and we went to Parliament Hill, and, and all of those things. But then, a most beautiful thing happened. Everybody went back into community, and language programs have begun, housing programs have begun, uh, cultural programs, cultural camps have begun all across the country. It's really amazing. You're not seeing it again now, because everyone's gone back to community, but what is going on since I don't know more is uh, what really needed to happen. It, it was kind of like, okay, it's okay to come out now, so to speak. Um, like personally, I feel sometimes, I feel that the worst has passed for our people. We've got, we've got a way ahead. Uh, there's transgenerational trauma from the residential schools. We haven't dealt with 60 scoop fully yet. We have a child and family service. Cindy Blackstock is still waiting. The tribunal four times now has said, pay up, pay up, pay up, we're still waiting. So there's a long way to go, uh, of course. But I don't know more set us on our way. There's no going back. There's no taking the pride away again. The pride is there. And um, it's really been amazing and beautiful <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> Any uh, questions for our panelists? Mm. Oh, yep. I'll ask you a question. Um, um, do you do you have any reflections on uh, 
some um, positive aspects of uh, the fight that you've come across recently? Like some examples of causes for hope for? We're still here. We're alive. <laughs> <laughs> Today in the census um, released, we're the fastest growing population, which is pretty great. We're having babies, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, our languages, uh, certainly in Mi'kmaq, uh, our language programs are great, and there's more of us learning language. I'm in the process of learning the language. Lots of people are learning our language now. And it's become very cool. One of the things that I love about what the young people are doing, they've grabbed apps. They've made all kinds of language apps. And so it's making it accessible to the youth, and it's become really, really cool to be learning their language. Um, there's a lot of programming and, and coding now in, in Indigenous languages that's going on and games that are being made by Indigenous youth in Indigenous languages and, and uh, so they're kind of indigenizing the world as well through apps. We were really early adopters to new technology as we are. We're smart people, right? We're like, oh, this, this is pretty cool. We're going to use it. And we use social media as well. Um, we use it as a tool, not a toy. And it's been a really tremendous way. I don't know more wouldn't have, uh, have occurred really to the extent that it did without us being able to connect across our nations. Because there are many, many different nations, by the way, right? We're not a uniform kind of, you know, I, I, sometimes I will say, well, look, in Europe, there's Germans, there's French, there's uh, Italians, the same over here, right? There's Cree, there's Mi'kmaq, there's Tlingit, there's, you know, Shuswap, there's all these different in indigenous um, nations, and we are nations, right? Uh, and uh, so the positive thing is that through all of this, we're still here. Like, that's amazing, right? What we've gone through, what we continue to, to go through, we are still here, and we're still making babies, and we're not gonna go anywhere, and we're gonna keep being us, though. That's one thing Canadians need to understand. We want to be who we are. The Mohawks wanna be Mohawks, the Cree wanna be Cree, the Mi'kmaq wanna be Mi'kmaq, and there are some, uh, you know, Mi'kmaq people who will say they're a Canadian too, but they will never not say that they're Mi'kmaq, right? And you will never find, I don't know of any indigenous nation in Canada who has said, we don't want to be who we are anymore, we want to become Canadians. Many will say, you know, yeah, I'm free with a Canadian passport, or I've got dual citizenship. But, so, we're not ever going to stop being who we are. <coughs> Just to, but it's not really... Positive. I just remember listening to the CBC driving one day, and um, I'm not sure who was being introduced. I caught just part of the interview, but clearly it was an Indigenous leader. And the CBC um, interviewer said something like, uh, "The Indigenous population is increasing uh, quite uh, rapidly," and it sounded like he was phrasing this like it was a problem. And the response he got was. Well, we love children and we love sex. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of fun actually online today about talking about us being the fastest growing population. A lot of comments were along that line. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should mention, uh, when we're talking about uh, Canada 150, uh, there also has been some interesting critique uh, by um, uh, talking about Black Lives Matter, uh, the uh, scholar uh, Dalhousie Afu Cooper and others, uh, Lawrence Hill, uh, said, you know, part of this is the erasure of a lot of uh, variations and that um, uh, the, the existence of a black diaspora and permanent residence, um, obviously just indeed is as old as the indigenous people, but it is uh, uh, Fool Cooper, among others, saying, you were always having to say we were here too, and we've been here for a long time, like centuries. Um, and so you're mentioning the War of 1812, but what's, what's the story of that? 
some of the uh, black settlements in this province of Scotia were the black refugees of the War of 1812, uh, as they were the black loyalists of the American Revolution and indigenous issues as well, and that um, indigenous people fought alongside the British because they were trying to get their promised land that was set aside in the Royal Proclamation of 1763. They're still waiting for that. Uh, and so it's not just uh, what I've said before was this curious thing that we are including now references to indigenous people. We are um, talking about diversity, but it's always in a way that leaves out a lot of the, the context and a lot of the reasoning. Um, at one example, I won't uh, pick on them because some of my colleagues were involved, it was a CBC series commissioned before the 150, which was called Canada, the Story of Us. 10 hours of treasury, it seemed. Um, and, yeah, and, and uh, it's actually worse than the earlier version about from 2000 to 2001 of people's history. Uh, and despite having you know better um, uh, computer you know imagery and some things, it, it still doesn't get it right. Um, and uh, part of the analysis for the failure of Canada, the story of us, was that it never was the story of us. They didn't consult enough indigenous scholars uh, or black scholars or others, um, and it was made on somewhat of a shoestring budget. Which comes back to Stephen Harper, if you know I don't like him that much. Um, he said Canada was never uh, a colonial power. He never, it was just, it just never happened. Uh, uh, Justin Trudeau says he won't say that, but he just says we can just smile and be happy, and, and uh, sunny ways will get us through. But that's obviously wearing thin at this point, as the uh, commission on murder and uh, missing Indigenous women and girls is just halting the movement ahead or not. Um, so, uh, if you were here on campus last year, it was about almost a year ago that Murray Sinclair uh, was here uh, as the um, heading up the, uh, the TRC, and he made a number of points, uh, but it simply was that we need to continue as an educational institution, as a university, to talk about these things, and I'm a bit concerned, as a Canadian historian, that um, while some people are coming through our high school system with a better sense of these issues, they're saying, uh, in our survey courses, um, oh yeah, we've already done that. You know, we did residential schools. We are, we are so over with residential schools. You can't tell us anything more. And we're thinking, oh yes, we can. Uh, you know, so we got it's a it's a process, and it's and it's going to be interactive, and it's going to be ongoing. Yes. I have a question. Actually, well, I have a question. Also, well, I'll start with one. All right. Yep. Um, thank you all so much for for what you shared. Uh, I'm just curious if you have any suggestions, thoughts, things that you've learned from your experience in terms of what it means to really um, live into reconciliation. So I know that there's recommendations, I know that like on certain institutional levels there's policies and practices, but I'm talking about like something that is like a embodied practice as a settler on the land um, of how to be able to really like truthfully and authentically live into into reconciliation, um, and I, like for me, sometimes too, I, I I try to understand like to to reconcile is to know. Like, how can we reconcile without knowing? And like, how as a nation do we begin a journey of reconciliation when there still isn't um, maybe a depth of relationship? I'm talking on maths now, so maybe those are two questions folded into one, like on a macro level, on a micro level, the in between that we can make of that jam. Yeah. Right, well, there is, there, there's kind of different actors here, right? There's the government, and then there's citizens, and you know, and then there's our leaders, and, and, and ourselves. And um, whenever Canadians ask me, what can I do? Um, I really need you to be pushing your leaders. I need you to do that. Whether you call them your leaders, whether you voted for them, whether you like don't like elections, or don't like the Liberals, or don't like, Whatever, they're your political representatives, and they are doing things in your name that harm my people. So, uh, you know, showing up at their office and telling them, you know, uh, that you need to follow through with the tribunal. You know, Andy Blackstock has won the case, you know, or go to their office and say, why are Mi'kmaq people still being arrested for going fishing? You know, like I want to put on my Facebook, like illegal and illegal fishing in Mi'kmaq. You can't say that in the same sentence. 
aren't right. Um, so we need you to do those things to really get after your leaders to change the policy. And that's at every level, sometimes even at the municipal level. You know, municipal, provincial, federal. Again, as I said, like even if you didn't vote for that person you don't like, them, they're still representing you. Um, and you, we need you to tell them what you what you want done on their behalf. Um, you know, show up for things. I, I mean, you know, the Alton gas site, we've got a treaty truck house down there. We have people that have been holding it down for over a year now. Um, I, we're always encouraging people to, to show up and visit and, and, and to see, like, show up at the front lines. You know, don't we? to see how the CBC frames a blockade, <laughs> right? It's like, go to the blockade long before then and sit and have tea with us and have something to eat and listen to an elder, tell some stories, listen to some warriors, crack some jokes, you know, like, and you will see a completely different thing than what you're seeing, what, it, what is framed on, on TV. Make friends with us, right, as individuals. Have us over for dinner, right? Like, make real friends with us, real, have real interactions with Indigenous peoples. But one thing I want you to do is to not think about what you're going to get. Because there are two cultural things here. I've often thought, you know, Indigenous peoples, we are givers. We will give and give and give. Even in the course of, of what has gone on to us, we will still give. We are still generous people. We'll still welcome you into our home. We'll still make you a cup of tea, sit you down with some moose stew. We will still do that. We are givers, givers, givers. Settler culture seems to be take, take, take on the macro level and the micro level. There doesn't, like even this concept, for instance, when people say, well, if I knew more about your culture, I don't need to know about someone's culture to just, like, be okay with them having human rights. I don't need to know their language. I don't need access to their ceremonies. Human beings have human rights to be who they are, right? Um, so don't think about what you can get. Also, be firm in who you are. We talked a little bit about Canadian identity, right? Because we have people sometimes that will come to us and they like want to be us or something, or they feel, you know. And it's like learn to be in solidarity with us without taking something. Only give. Like one of our original instructions as Indigenous people, many of us, is you know, is to be generous. And it's amazing how the more you give, think you're taken care of. Like you're just taking care of, right? But if you're on the take all the time, you never seem to have what you need. So think about what you can give. But get after your leaders, like in a, in a concrete, practical way, please. Like, you know, sometimes I post on my Facebook, like when something happens with Cindy Glad or Cindy Gladu case, or, or you know, when Cindy Blackstock with the tribunal, or when someone set and fired one of our fisher boats, I'm like, why aren't settlers rioting in the streets over this? You know, because it's not a hockey game, right? So, you know, no, please. You know, some of these things are really serious and they're being done in your name. If you don't want these things done in your name, then let your leaders know. I would uh, just briefly, um, I've had the advantage for the last few years to, to talk with Marie Batista, a Mi'kmaq uh, scholar from Mississippi originally, uh, who's now a professor of Indigenous Studies at University of Saskatchewan. And through her studies uh, and travels, uh, she went to New Zealand, and that may be a model that the New Zealand government has incorporated in a much more um, inclusive way than Maori culture. Now, I've read that hey, New Zealand's a smaller place, the Maori are smaller, it's not as diverse uh, as the Canadian experience, there may be some lessons from that, but when I listen to uh, people uh, from New Zealand speak about what they do, it's, it's, uh, it's more than just acknowledgement of territorial land, it's, it's, it's actually power sharing, it's language inclusivity, it's a lot, and it's, a, it's pretty burdensome. You kind of look at this as a, as a uh, non-indigenous person and say, well, that's a lot to expect, but it, it seems to be working for them, uh, and it may be the, the way forward. Um, so uh, they've learned from us, they say, um, but we learn from them. Uh, so New Zealand may be one example. What, something that I say to some people sometimes is, what, 
like, can you imagine living under Mi'kmaq laws and ways of being? And if you can't think of those, if you can't, like, living under our judicial structure and our educational structure and familial structures, like, if, if you think about that and that makes you, like, you're repulsed by that idea, why? Do you think we're not capable? Do you think that we may do the same to you that has been done to us? Like, these are the things that I think of, because that was the original, you know, Mi'kmaq Nation, we've always been, we're an international people. Everyone who came here, we made treaty with, right? We have never asked anyone to leave, right? Because we're international. We're like, yes, look, come, there's more than enough to share, right? Oh, yeah, I was just going to uh, expand on what Barb said about, um, you know, <clears throat> how you can help us, help the indigenous people in Mi'kmaq territory here, is not only to go to the provincial government and the federal government where it works, but also our government, because our Mi'kmaq government is not representing us either. And uh, if, if they had been, uh, we wouldn't be in the case where we are right now as women standing on the front line to protect the water and our, and our river <clears throat> because uh, they would have been able to do that. They would have been able to uh, stand up to the government and if they were doing what we said they should be doing, following our lead, you know, like this is they're supposed to represent the, the people, um, they would have been doing that. So when she says, go to your government, go to our government too. Write letters to Big Mac Rights Initiative and all the, uh, the Atlantic Policy Congress. Even though Sibyl Negative, my band does not belong to either one of those uh, organizations, a lot of their what they're saying and doing still impact us as a, as a First Nation. So um, I, I'd ask that, you know, like, like go beyond, go a little further. Well, they aren't our leadership, are they? They're the colonial leadership, right? Like that, yeah, I that people that understand, leadership. yeah. Like the band councils and counselors, that's an imposed system um, on our communities. And they're, they're literally not leaders in the big law sense. They're administrators of the Indian Act on reserve. Mm -hmm. And they only have the jurisdiction on that reserve. And they only have jurisdiction to administer the Indian Act. And the Indian Act is actually, in our case, in the Mi'kmaq case, it's actually a, a, a breach of treaty. It's an actual breach of the original treaty that we made with the settlers that moved here initially. Yeah, very, very complicated, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is, and that's the different, the different layers to understand. And it's, it's not easy, like I will reiterate that it's not easy, but if it's worth it, then you'll be on board if you believe it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Support our traditional government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, support traditional governments. <laughs> Any other questions for our panelists? Oh. Maybe I'll just ask because it seems to come up often when we when the discussion comes up you know, these these issues that should be easily fixed, you know, water, access to just these basic sorts of things. So I mean, we never seem to hear in the news about what is being done. So is, like, I, I, I would like to know, is the government, has the federal government taken any steps? Is there, bureaucracy is, there, is being done. <laughs> yeah, so. That's so. it, seriously. Just bureaucracy is being done. It's all talk, 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 talk. And there's all these bureaucrats that everything's got to go through. And it, it's by design, right? Like, I call it genocide by bureaucracy. Right? If we just slow things down enough, we'll starve them out, right? Um, and so there is supposed to be training programs, you know, for, uh, for water filtration systems and new systems put in, but, uh, you know, it's like molasses. It's just incredible what the bureaucracy is. I mean, you know, the same with the housing situation, right? And then this is why our children, you see how, how tricky it is, right? It's like the funding doesn't come through. And actually, I don't even like the word funding because it's the rent, right? It's the rent that Canadians pay for being on the land, on our land and having access to our resources. Um, when, when people say, you know, Indigenous people don't contribute, it's like, 
We gave all the land and all the resources. And that's the other thing with reconciliation. Like, if there's no land involved in, in, in this, then there can be no reconciliation. <coughs> we, again, want to be us and we want access to our resources and lands as we always had prior to, to settlement. That's all we've ever asked and that's what the treaty says. That's what our treaty says. Also, I need to acknowledge that there are different treaties across the land, so if you live in different territories, find out what your treaty obligations are, because you do have obligations. You also have benefits, but I want you to find out what territory you're in, what is the obligations, and what are the benefits, because the narrative is different in every, in every nation's territory. Can, can I just also make a, a, it's interesting to me that, that I'm thinking about this in a, a different context, but, it, it, it goes to what you were also asking. It, it seems to me that reconciliation here is complicated and harder because I think there's still a reluctance on the part of the settler population to, to really fully account for the fact of how virulent the form of settler colonialism was. And there's a, there's a part of me that just also thinks that, you know, and sometimes in comparison, you know, it's, a, it's, it's harder here than New Zealand because I think that, that what was done to indigenous people here was more genocidal, was more problematic, was, you know, that, that to use a feminist phrase, you know, was the imposition of heteropatriarchy, the settler colonialism, was so much more destructive, I would argue. I, I'm going to go on it's pretty here. Really it, it's pretty ugly news. I know that the, 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 yeah. the, the, the well, British I colonial historian is like, can, can we even make that comparison? <laughs> I, I actually think we should, I think we, at the very least, should be asking that question as to what does that actually look like? And I don't think we've asked those questions. And I think that the specificity of that, but I think it, it makes it, and the other thing, and this goes back to what both I think Peter and and Patricia were saying in, in different kinds of ways is our conception of what we think Canada is and our commemoration and our symbols and all of those things. And now we have JT who's like best friends with everybody and you know has his name and blah, blah, blah. So which then, and, and my point being, it then prevents us from getting to that point of really understanding the importance of the need for reconciliation. As set, I'm, I'm speaking from a yeah. settler position. That, that's yes. an argument that, that I'm making. I don't, yeah. Does yeah. that? Skins have been greased. I guess they oh. oh. yeah. No, actually, I'll, you're going to fall that way, so you go ahead. Since I've been going back to something else, you go ahead. I don't, if, I don't know if I'm quite following it, but a while ago, somebody asked about positive things, mm -hmm. and I'm probably not a I'm not the most learned person or any learned person to say this, but in my limited experience, I've been amazed at the positive things that I've seen women doing globally. Oh, yeah. And, and um, um, over many years when women come to campus, one of the things is it's so humbling to hear the stories that women tell about their uh, sisters and their residential school experience and that um, they're, they continue to be willing to tell those stories and to people like me. And then um, the women who went to the Dell people and said, we'll work with you to collect uh, environmental samples and mm -hmm. um, to do that and the eel trapping elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And the work you guys are doing, it, it might not feel positive mm -hmm. all the time, but from an outsider's perspective, it looks like totally too the things, the little, ways that people see it getting in and to make something happen, it's, it's amazing. So I, just in our part of the world, there's such amazing things happening, so it's, I hope it feels positive. Certainly, yeah. uh, <laughs> women in Wigmoggy are leading the charge, mm -hmm. for sure. And everywhere else. <laughs> yeah, and in other nations too. Well, and I don't know more too, you know, it was prompted by, yeah. I just want to follow up on a discussion with from a few seconds ago, I'm sorry to go back, but there was a lot of time about just to do, sunny ways, all the good stuff that was promised. And I, I do flash back to that sort of final tragically hip show where Gord Downey sort of shamed him publicly into saying, yes, we'll get her done. Except there's one problem I always have with that, which is that it's a settler talking to the settler, and I found the absence of sort of voice, the question in my mind was, okay, get it done, but 
what precisely needs to get done, not according to these two settlers, but according to people in this community. So Barbara, if I may, just ask the question, because you talked about going to elected officials, talking to them, what are the priorities, the real priority needs, if we're going to go to politicians, if we're going to have this discussion, what does the community need, not just in Pluto, not before Downey says what's needed, what, did, what is really needed and what should we be discussing and really highlight? We should be discussing in this, in these lands, in Mi'kma'ki, the, the treaty. The treaties are the foundation of what will allow us to live well together here. Everything else is an imposition and a breach of the treaties. Um, we negotiated to remain being us and allow you to remain being you, and there was to be non-interference, but sharing of resources and sharing of the land. We never ever said, we have never ceded, given, or surrendered an inch of our territory. And the treaty is not, you know, it's peace and friendship. Like, what part of peace and friendship? <laughs> you know, is a bad thing. Like, again, I go back to, like, can you imagine living under, uh, living in Mi'kma'ki instead of Nova Scotia? There will be no prisons. There will be no old age homes. There will be no homelessness. There will be no hunger or food insecurity. There will be no contamination of the rivers. We lived here from the beginning. And we were fine. We were living really well. Do you know that our living um, life expectancy was well into the 140s and 150s? prior to colonization. Now it's about 20 years less than the average Canadian. So again, you know, think about Mi'kma'ki and if that frightens you, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, you need to examine why. Like what don't you know or what do you think you know that is wrong about that? Because myself and some of us other Mi'kmaq people, we believe that this whole colonial thing is going to be a blip on the timeline of our nation. I would just add, um, in my time uh, here at CFX, we've had two conferences uh, speaking about the, the, the leadership of Indigenous women, especially Mi'kmaq. One uh, had the mother of uh, Donald Marshall Jr. Uh, speak when Elizabeth Blackwood, a survivor of the Shubenacadie Residential School, um, others, and these were searing. They were so emotional, and it's it's really an imposition to ask uh, Mi'kmaq women to do that type of performance again. But what uh, for those of us who were there, it was unforgettable. But the my point was. Most people weren't there, and I, I got it, you know, you weren't here as students, but those students weren't there. It was publicized, people didn't come. We really missed an opportunity. I don't know if we could do something like that again, or it doesn't have to be involved personal loss, but if we could stage something, people really should make a point of listening to it, because it, it is, it is life-altering. I mean, it is really, really powerful. So um, I, I w would encourage people to take advantage of this. Thing. And it is women. These were all led by women, and it was really unforgettable. If I might, uh, Mark, and, um, one of the things that struck me recently, um, and, and came back to me um, reading your introduction, and that's about um, living treaty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know why light bulb doesn't go off sooner, but treaty involves two separate partners, and, and the way I was raised was to think about treaties as, as an act of, well, I guess we call it colonization now, so it didn't matter to me to know what's in the damn treaty because it was settled, and somebody was speaking in my, my behalf, and it just occurs to me now that I've got to know what's in that treaty and what my obligations are, I think you said that tonight, yeah. um, so I think that is a starting point is to learn what the deal actually is and, and what each side has to make to, do that way, to live that way. Exactly. Because treaties are made between nations, by the way. You know, if Canada or certain Canadians try and say, well, they're not a nation or whatever, then they wouldn't have made it like we've got treat only tr only nations make treaties. So just the fact that the treaties exist is proof that we are a nation. 
And we don't need, you know, like I think it was Gerald Blow that said the Mi'kmaq don't need confirmation. We don't need no. confirmation, <laughs> right? As we said, the treaty is for you, it's not for us. We engaged in treaty with the Mohawk, we engaged with treaty with everybody on the sides of our, our territory. It's just a normal thing for us. And what treaty is, ultimately, down on the individual level, it's an act of sharing with each other. That's what it is. Whenever we share with each other and whenever we trade with each other, whenever we sit down to a meal together, we are a living treaty. When we're respectful to each other, when we listen to each other, when we hear each other, we are a living treaty. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, I guess uh, when you were speaking, and, and I, I agree with absolutely everything you're saying, I just want to know what you think of this. So you said something about don't ask what you as white people would get from it. I think there is an enlightened self-interest in for white people, for black people, for whatever people in North America, in Australia, we could talk about some of the crazy things that government is doing for their Aboriginal people. Uh, to make alliances, I mean, Ward Churchill wrote about this, about the United States, right? Uh, he said, you know, again, the same thing, the unceded land, and he said, if you acknowledge as white people that you live on Mohawk territory or whatever, he said, this country, that is not serving your best interests would be dissolved. So just simple things like if you don't like fracking in your drinking water, if you don't like standing rock or those oil lines that are going to destroy the environment in British Columbia, make alliances with indigenous people. And I'd rather, I'll tell you, I'd rather live in Mi'kmaq territory. I'm from the United States than live under the authority of he who shall not be named. So, you know, I think there's so well, part of our nation is on the yeah. bifurcated yeah, by yeah, the yeah. evolutionary line, yeah. 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 So there are some enlightened self-interest to, to working with indigenous people on environmental and other issues, I think. Well, you know, as, as I said, we believe that we've been here from the beginning, so we knew we know how to live in these lands as opposed to live off of them, mm. right? We know how to live with these lands. And we were very prepared when the settlers arrived to show them the ropes, right? Here's where the best fishing spots are. Here's where this, this is how you live in these lands if you want to live to be 150 years old and live a good life. We weren't hurt though. But we're still yakking, right? Like oh, we're still here. And we're still saying, treaty, 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 treaty. Oh, I just wanted to say, say something. Oh. It. And it's um we can't live without our allies. Yeah. We can't yeah. fight the, the the fights that we have to do right now to protect our land and water without our allies. Um so this is not an indigenous problem. We're not, we're not the problem, you know. <laughs> it's uh it's it's the way our, our lands are being treated, our air, our water, and it we all have to be to our share to protect for all of our future generations. And, and I think uh, we need to do it together. And when they say, when you were saying, you know, it's, it's not just up to us. And people do know that our treaties are strong. They have come to us and say, you have a treaty, you have a right to this, we'll stand with you. Which is, which is a big, you know, change in, in the way things were happening. But do you think, do you honestly think that there wouldn't have been another genocide massacre in Standing Rock if those allies were standing next to the <laughs> That's exactly yeah. what what could happen. Yeah. And uh, that's the only reason why there was not a genocide. Mm -hmm. Armies coming and wipe everybody down. Because there was um, Americans, mm -hmm. other Americans standing there. Uh, and oh, actually, it was the world standing with them because they were yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's what what stopped that. But also, they didn't lose the fight despite when all the other pipelines, yes. all the other places, and people yes. woke up yes. to protect their land and water and the mother earth for the for the rest of the their their future generations for the children and the, and the grandchildren. So I think uh, this awakening. Um, it's, it's as we're at a time right now that's really crucial uh, across the world, not only just here in Nova Scotia or Standing Rock or 
grassy narrows or muskrat falls and all these places, it's, uh, it's we're, we're at a crisis time and Mother Earth is dirty. And it's time for everybody to come together, reconcile. You know, the, what reconciliation is, it, to me, it's, um, it's standing together for a common, for, for humanity. For humanity, no color, no nothing, it's no religion. It's because we care for one another, we care for the, for the earth and everything that we in. And that's what true reconciliation is. Mm -hmm. Any question here? Yes. <coughs> Oh, I apologize because this is less of a question, um, but it seems to tie together a lot of things that have said, of course, have valued um, comments. <coughs> I was blessed last summer to be down in Oakland, and uh, it was a few days after the, the Day of Rage um, in response to the of SDO and yeah. all of that. And uh, I took part in a refinery healing walk that was led by a group of indigenous grandmothers. And the Black Lives Matter protesters came out in force and they were carrying I don't know more banners, um, and they were uh, behind the indigenous protesters very much. And um, it was really inspiring to me. And in terms of sort of where it's all going and what, what I take hope from, I see so many movements that are aligning themselves behind indigenous people right now. And especially sort of against the settler colonial mentality and seeing that we all share a, a common I don't like to use the word enemy, but common oppressors. Yes. And that um, though there's lots of groups in that struggle, the environmental folks and the women's movement and all of these folks have legitimacy, but there's this undeniable legitimacy within the, the indigenous, you know, call for sovereignty, basically. And um, so this, that's not really a question, but it was, it's really inspiring me to see um, so many groups coming together behind this banner and this changing the relationship with the land and really seeing who we are differently through through the eyes of the indigenous leaders are now offering us to see ourselves. So not Dr. a question, but yeah. yeah. Dr. Lynn Gale talked about uh, she wrote a great article called uh, Get Behind the Turtle, or she calls it Getting Behind the Turtle. And you know the premise is that the indigenous peoples in Canada are pretty much on the bottom of the road. So if you want real social justice and good living, then you want to get behind the people who are might be the slowest or the furthest back from the line. Because when we go across the finish line, everybody will be with us, right? Like when the when the turtle, if you all get behind the turtle, then everybody will be okay at the end of the race. Mm -hmm. um, and I strongly encourage people to look into some of the writings of Dr. Lynn Gale, by the way, in terms of solidarity building uh, in a respectful way. Hmm. As well, and that's L Y N N G E H L. Dr. Lynn Gale. She's on the Shnabi. Well, I think we're probably at the end of things, unless anybody got put up one last call for. <laughs> oh, I think a lot of movement, so. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>